So we're, we've got about 15 people joining us, which is great. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I'm Rebecca Morris, and I'm the presenter for this session. Um, there's another session going on in another uh, room that is on teaching with cases and this ca uh, in COVID-19. And I'm going to be focusing more on case writing in COVID-19 world. So we're going to be talking about um, trying to understand what works in this environment so that we can write cases that will be uh, engaging for students and will be bestsellers. And if we have an understanding of uh, what works in this COVID-19 world that we're in, uh, we can, you know, design our cases so that they get published and are become, you know, well-received cases. So um, most of you probably know that I'm the editor-in-chief of the Case Journal. The Case Journal is um, the uh, official journal of the Case Association, which it used to be called the Eastern Case Writers. So we're the Northeast uh, group of case writers affiliated with NACRA, and I edit the journal. And so I was inspired to create this session because of some of the things I'm seeing as an editor. So the very first submission I got of a COVID-19 case came at the end of March, which I thought was pretty stunning that somebody had already written a case about COVID-19 in March. But unfortunately, as I reviewed the case before I put it into the review system, I realized that the case that I had wasn't effective. For one thing, it didn't have an instructor's manual. Um, and that got me to thinking about what works in this kind of an environment. We're in this pandemic, everything's in an upheaval. You know, how does that affect the way in which we write cases? And so that's really the focus of what we're going to talk so um, the chat is open and I can see the chat. That's why I can't see myself as I have to be able to see the chat as well. So as I go through, if you have questions or comments or things you want to dig a little deeper in, you can just enter them into the chat. I'll try to keep my eye on the ball and, and uh, multitask here, but uh, we'll get a, a lot done in our hour. So, you know, if we talk about the challenges of COVID-19, this survey should be no big news to any of us. Um, I think it's kind of interesting if you look at the date of the survey, it was March 18th in 2020. That's just about the time that everything was blowing up in North America. And you know, 51% of the respondents to this AACSB survey had moved their classes online. And I think it's interesting, you can see the patterns in the other countries that uh, certainly Asia Pacific and the Europe, Middle East, and uh, Africa countries had already experienced their COVID peaks and were, had, were ahead of us in moving online. But it's pretty clear that most everybody's online all the time these days. Um, and uh, the experts at the Harvard Business School believe that there's a good likelihood that virtual learning in some capacity is gonna be part of our educational system for the foreseeable future. Uh, if you've ever taught with cases online, uh, I will tell you I've had mixed experience with it. Um, that um, you know the, the uh, uh, cases that we have sometimes work well online, and sometimes they just don't. And so, what I wanted to try to understand is why do some cases work well online, and why don't they? Is there some magic bullet or some magic cocktail that we could learn? that would help us write better cases that would work better online. So there are actually, oops, I clicked the wrong thing. Sorry about that. You know, so I, the question I wanted to find out about is what makes a good case for online learning? And I, I think Juan, you've got a point that we're gonna get to in just a little bit. So if we can hold on that one for just a few minutes, you're gonna be supported in just a little bit. So if we talk about what makes a good case for online learning, there are some elements that we could focus on that would help us write cases that were more interesting and more engaging. So uh, we're gonna be talking about these elements for a few minutes and then we'll be looking at some examples that, of uh, cases and deciding whether or not they'd work well or not. So uh, we have resonance, brevity, clarity, controversy, currency, multi-part, and multimedia. 
And so, you know, the thought is that if we can um, think th with these elements in mind as we write, we should be able to write cases that are more engaging for students and more likely to get published. So let's start talking about the different types of case, uh, elements here. And I clicked the wrong thing again. All right, so resonance. Um, you probably have noticed this in your classes, that uh, students are more likely to engage with cases that resonate with them. They like companies that are well known to them. They like products that are familiar to them. They like cases that are relatable. Uh, that the challenges don't seem to be so far out there that they can't really uh, understand or perceive them. So let me just give you a couple of quick examples. Uh, I've used a case on Starbucks, and most students have some experience with Starbucks, and they like to talk about Starbucks. They either love it or they hate it, but they will be engaged in a case about Starbucks because it's something comfortable for them and something that they know. I've also taught with a case on Whole Foods. And in Westfield, Massachusetts, where our university is located, we don't have a Whole Foods. So those students had never been in one of the Whole Foods stores, didn't really know what it was like. And, you know, obviously they're not the target demographic. You know, Whole Foods is going, you know, the other name for it's Whole Paycheck, right? And so Whole Foods is, is trying to target a, a higher income family than you know the students are so they don't really have any way to understand how a whole foods grocery store might be different than the grocery store you'd find and that's a key component of understanding the case if you really don't understand what whole foods is trying to do then it's really difficult to come up with any kind of recommendations that make sense becomes an important thing. Now, one of the things I want to kind of caution on this, this element is that I'm not saying that we shouldn't, shouldn't stretch our students at some point, um, that we shouldn't give them a company that they don't know much about or an industry that's particularly challenging. I think we should do that, but maybe not at the beginning of the semester. Um, we want students to really engage with our cases, though. It helps if we keep resonance in mind. The other thing that uh, makes a big difference in online cases is the brevity of the case itself. Um, this is a slide I've used in many different contexts. Um, and that is that, you know, the traditional cases, uh, the old beat up trunk, are about 12 to 15 pages of text. And they have five to six learning objectives. I think you've probably encountered a student that just says, why would I read, you know, 15 pages on an industry I don't even care about? and they don't bother to read the case, which makes it a little hard for any learning to occur because there can't really be any meaningful discussion. Uh, at the case journal, we've pioneered compact cases, uh, the little tiny briefcase there. We write cases that are a thousand words or less. It's about two to three pages of text, and it usually focuses on one to two learning objectives. These shorter cases are really well received by students. The case is designed to be read in about 15 minutes. And, you know, the focus of the case is a, a significantly narrower than a traditional case, but it's enough to um, get the conversation started to, you know, the two learning objectives, you can achieve them very well. I can do a whole strategy case in a thousand words. At first, I didn't believe it, but I did write one that was a proof of concept and it, it actually teaches quite well. So brevity sometimes helps in an online environment because as you probably have recognized, our students are just overwhelmed. They're in Zoom classes all day. You know, it's just really hard to get their attention and to really get them to do the preparations that they need to, to have a meaningful discussion. Uh, the question was asked, will the journals welcome compact cases for publishing? We publish them all the time. I will tell you that the CRJ, the Case Research Journal, which is affiliated with NACRA, is planning a special issue on short cases next year. So you should watch for that call. Um, their definition of a, a short case and our definition of a compact case are significantly different. Their, their cases are about twice as long as ours are, but they're still significantly smaller than a traditional case. So you might look for that call as it comes out. Uh, I don't know what the timing is on it, but there will be a special issue 
Uh, in between cases, that would be about what NACRA's short case. Maybe that's a little bit longer. Um, it's, a, it's a special talent, I will tell you, to write a case that's that short. Uh, one of the things you quickly learn is, is to express what you want very directly uh, without a lot of adjectives and other extraneous words. And it takes some time. Uh, you know, the word counter on your uh, uh, word processor is, is really helpful because you can begin writing your case and realize, oh, I've already written 350 words and I haven't gotten to the point yet. And so this is not going to work. So shorter cases tend to, to, to uh, be a lot more engaging for students. Um, if it only takes 15 minutes to read the case, most students will have read it. And so if you're having a synchronous discussion, they can actually participate. If they haven't read it, they'll read it while you're having the first part of the discussion and they'll be able to participate um, significantly more. Uh, Juan is indicating that the last short cases, the special uh, edition of CRJ, they were four pages plus two exhibits. Now here's the other thing that differentiates TCJ from uh, the case research journal is that um, we don't count the exhibits as part of the word count. So you can have a thousand words, but you can have 10 exhibits if you really can justify all of them. All right, so let's move on then. So we can write cases that are shorter and that can help us. Um, the next two elements are clarity and controversy. Um, if you're talking about doing a case online or teaching a case online, especially in an asynchronous environment where the discussion is occurring whenever and not at the same time, there's really no opportunity to add clarification. So the case really has to be very clear in the way it's written. It has to avoid using jargon. It has to, you know, st students that read a case and then have too many questions really don't get to the analysis. Um, and there's just no opportunity to correct them in an online environment. So it's going to really put a big burden on us as authors to write cases that are very, very clear. So in terms of controversy, we also know that students engage in cases better if there are big turning points and high ambiguity. Uh, they find the, these cases to be far more interesting uh, than cases that really don't have a lot going on, they'll say. Um, and they also like cases where there are unexpected actions or there are, the a protagonist has a significant challenge that they have to overcome. Um, one of the things about having cases that are controversial, that have big controversies in them, is that it can generate some pretty intense discussion. And it may take us uh, a little bit of development as professors to be able to develop the skills that we need to manage uh, that kind of conflict in a, in a discussion. But what you'll find is students do engage in it. They will talk about it and uh, contribute to discussion boards and do all of those kinds of things uh, because they, there's something at stake in the case itself. There's something that um, compels them to state their opinion and to really get into the case, whereas some cases um, don't have that kind of tension and uh, the student reads the case and says, you know, so what? Um, and what we want is for them to say, well, no, that's outrageous. They shouldn't you know, be doing this or whatever, um, that there should be some emotion to it. Another thing that tends to um, help us in an online case environment is if the case itself has multiple parts. Uh, this is where you have an A case, a B case, and a C case all about the same company. And each of the parts focuses on a particular issue. Now, some people do this by design, and they might do it because the case you know, they know something about what happened in the case in, <coughs> excuse me, 2015, and then they know an update in 2018, and so 2015 becomes the A case, what should they do in 2015, and then 20, uh, 2018 becomes the B case, and then now we might be able to have a C case in 2020. Um, the advantage of this in online teaching is that the professor can change the conversation or move the topic, the flow of conversation, by just shifting from one uh, case to another. So we can talk about the A case, and, and I don't know if you've had online discussions where the, the discussion kind of bogs down, the students have lost interest, 
and we need to re-energize them again. Well, we could move to the B case, and now the B case has a different issue, and we can shift to that. <coughs> you know, where cases don't have multi-parts, some people are addressing that by using articles, blog posts, and so forth to extend the time of the case. Drink time. All right. So moving on. The next one I want to talk about is multimedia. And we know that students respond well to multimedia. Um, this is the world. So we can have uh, videos, podcasts, photos, and so forth um, into the um, uh, multimedia. Um, that really helps engage students. Um, in both CRJ and the, uh, the case journal, oftentimes these multimedia pieces are described in the instructor's manual. You know, and one of the things that we can do is to be especially generous about how we include these kind of things in the instructor's manual. You know, it's useful to put a short description of what does the video show, what, what you know, and when should I show it in the discussion? Is this the kind of video I should use to introduce the case? provide a little background, a little visual that gets them kind of uh, excited about it, engaged before we start the discussion? Or is this the kind of video I should show at a certain part of the or whatnot? Uh, it also helps if we include the duration of the video or the podcast so that um, our online student can decide whether they have time to watch it now or whether they have to wait until some other time. Now we're going to talk about the currency. And here I'm not talking about, you know, what kind is it in euros or is it in dollars. We're talking about uh, whether the case is recent or not. Um, with COVID-19, how fast things have changed. I thought this statistic was really stunning. During a one-week period in March, U.S. grocery store sales spiked 77% over the previous year, while restaurants spiked 76%. I mean, that kind of change we never see, you know, uh, in groceries in particular. And uh, it's just kind of fascinating to see how it changed. Here's another one. 54% of Americans are cooking now more than ever um, as a result of this. You know, so we're seeing major shifts in things, and they're happening pretty quickly. Uh, this is on I'm a strategy person, so this one has to do with a, a business strategy. Scale, which was previously a massive competitive asset, is increasingly a large liability. So we're talking about things that are, are evolving all the time, and that we're having this rate of change that's very consistent in that it's disruptive and rapid. And that makes it a little challenging to write cases because basically we have to think about, well, what's the new normal going to look like? Um, you know, we're writing cases about an event that's happening right now, and it's changing week to week, month to month. And that makes it really, really challenging. You know, as you've probably learned as you start writing cases, um, that you have to have a frame, a time frame for your case. You have to decide when it begins and when it ends. It's kind of hard to decide what that time frame should be in a COVID-19 world, because everything's changing quite so rapidly. But let's look and see if we think that uh, there's a possibility that we could write cases about COVID-19. So let's figure out what these challenges are and how we might address them. Um, so if we think about how, what's going to be the new normal, and this is just certainly one perspective. It's from the McKinsey Company. It was a July 2020 uh, article. Uh, talking about five forces that they thought were going to change the business climate. So the first was changing demand. And here they were talking about things like, uh, you know, the demand for cooking products changed as uh, we saw in one of the earlier slides. Uh, you know, that, uh, brands right and left, um, and that they're placing a greater emphasis on uh, locally sourced products and things like that. And so that the demand for products is changing in ways that they haven't experienced before. Uh, the second piece there, uh, altered workforce. We probably know this one best of all these on here, right? Because most of us are still working from home. Uh, we've learned to work remotely. 
then companies are finding out that it's working far better than they ever thought it would. Um, and there will be some changes most likely to the way work goes as we go forward. The third one here is resiliency. Um, again, being a strategy person, I kind of look at these kind of things from that lens. Um, and what this one is about is companies trying to have more flexibility, more strategic flexibility in particular. So they're doing things like divesting certain assets and having more things holding it in cash because we really don't know what's coming you know, in the next wave of COVID-19 or the next year or so. And so companies are wanting to make sure that they're protected. Uh, they're designing new products to meet some of the changing demands that they're seeing. Um, they're changing their scale of operations, downsizing sometimes, again, to have more strategic flexibility should things shift in ways that they really hadn't expected. Uh, regulatory uncertainty becomes a big issue. Uh, you know, there's uh, in the United States certainly a lot of uncertainty about uh, the stimulus package. We're in an election year. Uh, will we have uh, support for businesses in the next stimulus package or not? Uh, some companies are onshoring because they really aren't sure about tariffs and export regulations and whether they're going to be able to do things the way they've done them in the past. And then the last one, of course, is the evolution of the virus. And it's anybody's guess what's, what's happening there. Every time we think we've done a good job and, and infection rates are low, uh, we see a second wave coming. Uh, will the second wave be worse than the first? Certainly there are a lot of pundits that are saying that, um, but we really don't know. But you know, if you look at all of these things, of uh, the items on the right side of the slide, strategic options and HR and OB options, I was trying to think, okay, can we write cases about COVID-19? Again, I'm a strategy person. Yes, we can talk about redeploying talent. We could talk about pivoting. It's my new favorite word this year. Uh, shifting operations, launching new business models. All of those would be really ripe for uh, casework in the strategy area. In HR and OB, we, the altered workforce is certainly going to be a, a, a lots of opportunities for cases to be written. Um, you know, how, how do people adapt to this changing workforce? Uh, what kind of stresses do employees encounter? The whole family work-life balance issue for companies um, makes us a, uh, you know, really a good uh, basis for cases. And so this is going to be a little harder to do since we can't have, I can't see you and we can't really have a conversation, but I'd like this to be brainstorming time. Let's spend a few minutes, you know, given what I've told you so far, are there any disciplines or theoretical perspectives you can think of that would make good COVID-19 cases? So, you know, are there any good COVID-19 cases in the leadership area and what kinds of leadership theories might make that work. So if you could type one or two ideas in the next, in the chat in the next few minutes, we can look at what, what kinds of creative things you come up with. So we've got, what about contract tracing apps to fight COVID-19? Uh, that could be uh, a source of, of uh, case information. Uh, we have, I'm working on a COVID-19 case in marketing and retail. Uh, secondary source cases, yes. It's going to be a little hard to do interviews in a COVID-19 world. Um, I don't think people want you coming to their house. Janet teaches sports. Uh, the whole adaptation of that industry to no fans could be an interesting one. Uh, certainly, it's got to impact the business models, right? Okay, keep that in mind as we go through. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, cases. And, and some of the questions you're asking about the case journal and things like that, I'll get to later. But uh, right now, comp compensation restructuring, certainly a good one with the remote workforce. Ah. My best friend. Yes, Zoom has become everyone's best friend. Don't you wish you had had stock in Zoom before the virus hit? So my point is, and this is my perspective as an editor, when you're writing a COVID-19 case, you're really walking the razor's edge. 
if you spend too much time focusing on COVID-19, and that's, that's why I hesitated a little bit about the contact tracing apps, your case is going to become dated very quickly. You know, let's assume that COVID-19 is really well handled by 2022. In 2025, are people going to want to read about it? In 2026, are people going to read about it? Um, you know, they're saying this is a 100-year, you know, it hasn't been like this for over 100 years. So at what point, you know, if you focus too much just on the COVID-19 aspects of your case, you're going to wind up with a case that may not get, not, may not be seen as relevant by the time it gets published. I mean, it may be all over and done with. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the plus side here, if, if we use a theoretical lens like an adaptation, crisis management, leadership, or ethics, what we're going to have is a case that has elements that are transferable, that the learning that the student might get from reading your case, yes, it's about COVID-19 and the challenges that posed for business, but these, these theoretical lenses are going to allow that case to have uh, a life beyond the pandemic. Um, and in terms of if we frame the case with these kind of mental perspectives, these mental models or frameworks, um, there's going to be good learning that we can get from the case well after the pandemic. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is to create something that isn't so dated that no one will want to read it, right? And I'll give you some examples as we go through. Oop, wrong key there. All right, one more time here. Okay, now the title on this slide says, does this milk smell funny? And you can tell by the picture what I'm referencing here. We all do this, don't we? That you, you think that the milk might be bad in your refrigerator. You look at it, it looks kind of bad, but the first thing we do is we smell the milk, right? And we use that to, to judge whether we should throw the milk out or we can go ahead and drink it. Uh, I wrote an editorial letter for the Case Journal, and this was the title of the editorial letter was, Does This Milk Smell Funny? And what I was advocating in that letter is that periodically we should look at the cases that we use in our class and determine whether they're still fresh for student consumption. Or do they smell a little funny? Are they a little too old? And so, um, you know, what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, was part of the, the editorial letter was what makes a classic case. And, and that's something I think that will help us as we write these COVID-19 cases that we have to kind of keep in mind is that the, we can't make it so specific to only the pandemic that it's only useful now and maybe 100 years from now. Um, we need to have a life. So the first question I ask is dependent upon a particular time period. Uh, who today would want to read a case about the Y2K bug? Um, it's 2020. That was 20 years ago. Students would turn their noses up at that case and wouldn't go any further than the first paragraph once they realized that it was about an event that happened 20 years ago, probably before most of them were born. Um, another example, uh, I wrote a case about GlaxoSmithKline, and it had to do with uh, pricing of um, HIV AIDS drugs in uh, global and I tried to use that in class and, and my students didn't know what HIV AIDS was. So, I mean, it was long enough ago that they, the only way I could get them to connect to it is I said, okay, you've seen the movie Rent, right? And they said, yes, we've seen it. I said, okay, that was HIV AIDS. And, oh, okay, you know, but I mean, it's just so far out of their context that they really can't relate to it. Um, the second point there, is the analysis dependent on students' knowledge of business conditions of more than three years ago? I have reviewers that will reject a case that's set any further back than three years ago. They said, you know, this just doesn't work for students. It's just not something that, you know, some of them will say, I wasn't even paying attention to the business environment three years ago. How am I supposed to know what the economy was doing? Um, so we really have to kind of think about that. Now, um, TCJ in particular does not have... A um, that they will, you know, that they won't publish your case if it's, you know, five years old. Uh, you do want to think older, the farther back it gets in history, uh, the more they see it as history and not relevant to them in this particular time. And oftentimes, you know, this is probably a mistake on their part, 
they conclude that the elements of the case really just, it, you know, the outcomes don't make any, any difference because it's so old that, you know, of course we wouldn't do that today. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, more of does this milk smell funny? Uh, does the case address a unique situation that is timeless or at least still relevant? So in terms of timelessness, it's really unfortunate, but HR cases that are about discriminatory hiring, evaluation, or promotion are unfortunately still relevant today, even though they might be describing an event years ago. Unfortunately, societal change hasn't occurred fast enough that that case would be irrelevant. And a lot of times you'll find those kind of HR cases, they are a little bit vague about their dates. The issues still the same as they would have been, you know, 10 years ago when the case was was live. Um, and then we also have to worry about um, whether they're still relevant. So the picture of the fly there, if you watch the debate on Wednesday of the vice presidents of the United States, uh, a fly landed on uh, Vice President Pence's head. It's the the rage. It's There are all sorts of memes on Facebook today. Um, but a week from now, or is that going to still be relevant? Probably not. There's going to be some other issue that's going to take precedence. And if I wrote about the fly, it's probably not going to make much difference. So we do need to kind of think about whether the situation we're describing is so unique that it's still relevant. It's got some timeless quality to it that makes it a case, you know, an issue that even though it's old, it still has good learning value. Although you do have to, that is a hurdle you have to address with students. Oh, wrong way. One more. This lady really doesn't like the smell of her milk. Um, so we also have to think about the theories, concepts, and analytical frameworks. And these are the things that we're going to use in the instructor's manual to analyze the case data. And we have to make sure that we're using frameworks and, and models that are still relevant and that they haven't been replaced, <coughs> excuse me, by newer ones. Um, as a strategy person, you know, uh, 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 and an editor, I, I can be kind of tough sometimes because a lot of people want to write a strategy case and they want to have it have the students use a uh, SWOT analysis to analyze the case. And the problem is that SWOT is so old. We, you know, have basically we would don't even encourage our students to do it anymore. We have them do pestle and porters and resource based view. You know, SWAT's not very relevant. And so if all your case can do is SWAT, um, people may reject it and just say, look, there's just not enough here. That really needs to do more than that. you're using an old analytical model and you're not making a significant contribution to the literature. Um, we also have to worry about the learning objectives still being relevant in um, our academic disciplines. I mean, academic disciplines change over time quite a bit. And there are things that we used to teach in like principles of management that we don't even talk about anymore. And so if your case is, is using old theory, old data, old learning objectives, uh, your case is going to smell funny and it's not going to go very far in the review process. So you want to really be careful. Um, if you're interested in reading the whole editorial letter, uh, Five Forces is a good model. We, we do a lot of porters. Um, if, we, if you want to read the full editorial letter, I put the link to the editorial in the Emerald booth in the uh, um, hop-in site. So if you go to the Emerald booth, uh, the link's in the chat there and you can read the whole thing. All right. So let's look at some examples of cases. <coughs> These are cases that are not yet written, but they could be about COVID-19. And let's decide whether they match up with some of the things I've been saying, and whether they would be a successful case or an unsuccessful case. So the first one I have is, uh, this is an article from Bloomberg uh, Business Week. When bakers demanded more flour, King Arthur went to the mills. Uh, this company is a New England company. They're headquartered in New Hampshire. They're 230 years old. They opened when George Washington was president. And they happen to be the oldest flour mill in the United States. 
they had been a fairly conservative company, but um, the COVID pandemic caused demand for flour to, to triple in March. And if you have Instagram, you know why this is, because you've seen pictures of all the sourdough loaves of bread that people were baking during the pandemic just to have something to do. We couldn't go outside, so we uh, developed new hobbies and so forth. So flour just soared. Um, they were saying that the, the safety stock that the company had uh, was depleted in only two weeks. And if you remember that time in March, you went to the grocery store and the whole flour aisle would be completely empty. There was no flour to buy. Um, you know, so what does a company do? Um, you know, they had to ask themselves, is this increase in demand going to last? Once this pandemic is over, once the economy reopens, will people bake as much? And, you know, how, you know, they didn't necessarily want to expand their business for a demand that was sort of a fad. Um, and so they were, you know, trying to explore some options. So does this work as a COVID-19 case? You could put it in the chat. Yes, no? Would you be interested in it? Yes, so I've got a couple of yeses. What elements about it make it work, do you think? Three yeses. I'll give you a hint on this one. Let's see. Okay, you can take away the COVID-19 and insert another reason for a spike in demand. So there is some learning value that will be independent of the COVID-19 uh, phenomenon. Uh, it's relevant in business today. Do you think students would respond to this? Would it be engaging for them? It's flour. They understand flour, right? Um, they understand baking. Um, you know, so it's it's relatable. Um, it's a pretty good challenge. The uniqueness of it, I think, is the age of the company. Um, to think about a company that's been around that long having to make changes. I mean, it could be pretty interesting. So we agreed that this one would work. All right, has learning value beyond just the COVID stuff, right? All right, what about this one? Let's shift gears a little bit. Article, others made in America since 1818 may soon need a new calling card. The uh, clothing brand is all dressed up, but uh, has dressed all but four U.S. presidents. Could end up closing its three American factories <laughs> as it navigates the pandemic. Um, the other aspect of this one that makes it somewhat interesting is they filed for bankruptcy in July of 2020. Uh, they've been closing stores, uh, at, you know, all the way through. Um, you know, this relates a little bit to the changing workforce, doesn't it? You've been out there buying suits? Anybody? Um, you know, as we work at home, um, our wardrobe needs are different, right? It's relevant if you're talking about chapter, but it's also relevant from a strategy uh, perspective. <coughs> if you want to talk about uh, companies that have failed to change with the times, I mean, they were probably in trouble well before COVID-19. Uh, they were probably in trouble because they've uh, long uh, had a conservative line of clothing and that people have changed what they wear to work. And so, you know, it, it could be interesting to tease out um, how many um, people are have really changed their works, have really um, adjusted things in ways that um, make a company like Brook Brothers look really old fashioned. And this was well before the virus. Now, the virus kind of compounds it. You know, when you have to close all your stores and you have zero sales, that makes it much more difficult. All right, somebody comments, students don't dress like this. They don't. Um, they, you might have to use a video to get them into this. 
um, and that they might need to understand what the clothing it, it looks like and what the stores look like and things like that. But you should probably be able to find a news story or two about the company at, you know, as they were closing stores. I mean, the whole notion of made in America, you know, that could it in itself could create some discussion, whether that's a relevant issue for consumers or not. Um, the advantage the bankruptcy provides back to bankruptcy is that um, when they file for bankruptcy, they're going to be court records. And those become great sources of information if you're going to use a secondary sourced case, because you oftentimes have transcripts of testimony. <sighs> Time for a chug. Okay. Brooks Brothers does have stores globally, um, but, you know, it's it's just one of those things that they really haven't adapted with the time. We're probably in trouble well ahead. Um, but it does seem like there would be, you know, some COVID elements to it. Tease out what was the problem before and what was really caused by the virus. And, you know, that could be interesting. Um, you know, there's certainly research that suggests that, Managers will point to the external environment as the problem rather than to consider the internal environment of their organization. And we can expect that Brooks Brothers executives would probably do the same thing. So let's talk about this one. Uh, this is really, really recent. This just happened in the last week. So Notre Dame's president faces an angry campus after the virus. Uh, the president of the Reverend John Jenkins, Father Jenkins, is the man standing next to the red, the lady in the red dress with the priest collar on. And he was at the uh, um, ceremony at the Rose Garden um, and has contracted um, coronavirus. Um, what makes this interesting is he's president of a university. And as you know, most all of our universities are challenged with trying to keep our students safe. And he'd expelled students uh, from some uh, uh, from Notre Dame because they had violated the protocols that he was, you know, want to wear a mask and you know don't congregate in large groups and all that kind of stuff. And they really see it as being a major issue um, that you know he went to this event is in this, look at how crowded that room is. And he's in inside with all these people without masks on. And so they see it a little bit as being hypocritical. <coughs> this issue is so current that there was an article in the Chronicle of H Higher Education Today, and the title of the article is The Moral Failure, Failure of Father John Jenkins. And so, I mean, this is going to be, it would be a challenging one to take on because it's so current are happening right now. Um, you, you know, it would be really difficult to, to uh, get your arms around this and figure out what the case is because it's so evolving. Um, the editorial in the Chronicles makes me think that, that Father Jenkins might be looking for another job in the next. Um, so, you know, you'd almost have to wait for this one to come to some sort of conclusion before you could write a case. But would there be issues that would be related to coronavirus. Um, the case, do you think? What frameworks might we use to, to think about this particular case? Again, you're going to type in the chat. And I'm going to drink water while you do it. Uh, Janet says leadership, ethical decision making, Sarah, management. Uh, you know, depending on what the students do, there could be all sorts of reputation management, succession planning. There's lots of good issues, right? Now, again, what we're trying to do is we're, we're talking about crisis, civic duties and responsibility, good, good ideas that will give this case life after the virus is contained. And that, that's really, I think, where we need to be going with some of the, the writing about uh, coronavirus, because if we only write about the virus, it, very dated, and no one's going to want to read them in perhaps two or three years. And, and 
an interesting issue. Now, what about this one? Let's go to number four here. I'm going to drink some more. Number four is, our area restaurants adjust to coronavirus mandates. Many start new curbside options. This is from the Meriden Record Journal, Meriden, Connecticut. Are you interested in a case about this? Would it make a good coronavirus case? Uh, I get a no, I get a yes. Do you really care what's going on at a restaurant in Meriden, Connecticut? Oh, Janet does because she's in Connecticut. <coughs> I'm in Connecticut too. Um, my point in this one is um, sometimes there are cases that focus on such a narrow, small company that unless that company's doing something really unusual or the uh, protagonist is really um, engaging, you know, that the, they're, they're going to give you really great quotes and have some really cool perspectives on things, that some of these kind of things are just too small. They don't really uh, resonate as cases because this restaurant's really doing nothing different than any other restaurant's doing. And, you know, yes, we could talk about it as um, an industry, but I would suggest that if you really want to publish a case and you're going to spend a lot of time doing research on it and writing it, that you probably should find a more engaging uh, place to write about, um, something that has really more going for it. Um, that there's more tension to it, that there's more um, focus, that, you know, something something special about it that will cause people to want to read it. You know, if you're going to write about your neighborhood restaurant, maybe it's meaningful to you, but will it be meaningful to somebody across the globe? Will they find it as engaging as you do? Well, they might if the, you know, uh, the restaurant owner has just some really interesting perspectives or they're doing some ideas that you've never heard of before, maybe then. But we have to watch that um, the issues are not so local that, you know, nobody outside that region really, really cares. Um, you know, so is it unique enough? Um, one of the issues with this kind of a case would be you'd almost have to have primary data in order to write it. You'd have to really have a good relationship with the people at this restaurant so that you had in how things were going and how well they were working and what they were thinking, right? Yeah, it's just uh, online deliveries were around even before the pandemic. Of course, some of us just only figured out how to do it when we couldn't get food any other way. But I mean, a lot of the cases that I've been getting so far, and quite frankly, I have not published a COVID-19 case. And that's been because they really have been so small, so narrow, um, you know, that, and no attempt to extrapolate beyond this narrow situation to a larger industry issue or anything like that. <coughs> that they haven't really come across as being very interesting. And <clears throat> a lot of times the reviewers will just reject them out of hand um, because they'll just say, look, there's just not enough there. There's not enough there for us to be super engaged in this particular case. So, whoops, I clicked the wrong thing again. So let's talk about some of the challenges of trying to write a COVID case. Um, the first one I think we all appreciate. Uh, you know, rapidly evolving situations are really going to make this difficult. It seems like at, at my job anyway, things change week to week, day to day. One day you think you're doing one thing and the next day something else happens. So it's going to be really hard to get your uh, arms around a rapidly evolving situation. But that in itself is kind of a learning opportunity, isn't it? Um, talking about the speed of decisions and the need to make hard decisions very quickly because of the challenges of this environment, that could be some really good learning, I think, for students. Uh, the second point here, it's hard to tell at this point what adaptations will be most successful. And that's been the other issue with some of the cases that I've received as submissions, is they're writing cases that are talking about organizations as being particular, 
particularly successful at ad adapting to the virus and the pandemic. And there really isn't any data that supports that. Um, it's because it's, it's all of this is too new and we really don't know how things are going to turn out. Um, you know, we certainly have seen companies uh, do things and then very quickly because whatever they tried to do didn't work. And so they have, have gone on to other things pretty quickly. So that's going to make it a little bit more challenging to write a case. Um, there are also other challenges. <clears throat> uh, there is a tendency to emphasize failure cases, to write uh, cases about companies that made poor decisions and had bad outcomes. You know, the uh, Brooks Brothers is going to be a failure case, right, unless they can turn it around in their bankruptcy. But, um, you know, we uh, students, we need to feed just failure cases. Um, I like a failure case now and then when I teach because uh, recommendations are pretty easy for students to develop. You know, everything's wrong in this case. They made so many bad decisions. You know, the students get a lot of confidence boost out of being able to step into a case and say, I could do this better than those yo-yos that were running that company and that they can come up with recommendations. Recommendations are a lot harder to come up with when the company's doing exceedingly well. And so students find those a little bit more challenging. Now, I, I believe we need to give students a, a mix of things, not all failure, not all success. But, um, you know, it, uh, what we want to be careful about is the um, results aren't all in yet. Um, a lot of the adaptations we're seeing, we just really don't know whether they've been successful, whether the success is going to be short term or long term. And it makes it a little difficult right now to write these cases. Um, and the last one's one that I have a lot of concern about, and that is that the publication process may take too long. You write the case, you submit it to a journal, the editor sends it to reviewers, the reviewers take their own sweet time on things, and this is truly how it goes, and then you have to do a revision, and then you go through the whole review process once again, and I'm going to tell you that uh, case writing is probably a little harder um, it sometimes takes multiple revision cycles before a case is accepted for publication. And then that could be, you know, anywhere from the shortest would probably be six months. And that would be like really, really rare um, to about 18 months to two years or longer. <coughs> and that gets to be really difficult when you're writing about time sensitive kinds of things like a virus. Um, you know, I have a couple of ideas about how we can address this. Um, you know, if we uh, uh, want to try to uh, fast track some of these through the uh, review process, that could probably help. If we had uh, uh, reviewers that were committed to, um, you know, uh, uh, committed to doing um, a uh, fast turnaround on a review, that could help us get it into the publication process quicker. Uh, the other thing we have to watch is that <coughs> if we um, spend, you know, write about a really well-known company, by the time the case gets published, students can just Google what the company actually did, and the discussion goes pretty flat because, it, you know, somebody, somebody will say in like the first five minutes of discussion, well, don't you know that the company, you know, went out of business, closed all their factories and went bankrupt? Well, you know, what kind of discussion are you going to have after that's disclosed? I think we really need to address this. Um, but my main point is that we have to be careful that we think about what makes a case a classic case and trying to build it around the that will have learning value long after this pandemic is over if we want the case to be published. If we write only about very narrow things that are about the virus itself, it's going to be very difficult to get that case published and it's going to have a very short self shelf life. It's going to start smelling sooner than you think it will. And so we need to take care of that. So at this point, um, I'm ready for questions, if you have any. 
All right. Hopefully this has been helpful. Hopefully you'll write a case that I can publish because I would love to publish COVID-19 cases because it's one of the big challenges of our lifetimes. What about when you generalize the learning outcomes? The learning outcomes should be generalized. Um, they should be related to the case, but the learning outcomes, if I want to understand um, uh, effective leadership in a crisis, that would be a learning objective that I could use with a COVID-19 case, which would give it a shelf life that would be a lot longer. Uh, Samila asks if we take the strategic option, is it better to write the case on COVID or a research paper on COVID? Uh, both of them have the same challenges in that we're, we're dealing with rapidly moving situations and the publication cycle is unfortunately long. Uh, I think you could do, go either way on this. It just kind of depends on what you want to accomplish. Right. Organizational learning and reinvention of business models or cultures, creative solutions. That would certainly be a great framework for thinking about COVID issues. Um, and that sometimes, you know, a lot of case writers start by writing the learning objectives and then write the case because that helps you decide what goes in the case and what doesn't go in the case and what the time frame should be. So, you know, if you think about what is it that I want the students to learn by, by studying this case, it really is a, a great way to shape the, the writing. Uh, does the case journal have a special issue coming up? We don't, but don't you think we should write one on COVID-19? A special issue with fast track for reviewers? Any interest in that? Yeah, I think my, one of my publication partners is on the call, so maybe she'll chime in too. Um, yeah, I haven't proposed it, but as I was getting ready for this, I was thinking, you know, maybe there should be something that comes up that we could fast track so we could get these cases out into the world quicker. Uh, one of the things we do at the Case Journal is we publish cases as they are accepted because um, we're an online journal. So uh, they format them and get them online. We don't have to wait till I get a whole uh, issue together before we publish. So <coughs> that end process could work very quicker, very quickly. I mean, I think the, the real challenge for me would be to get a group of dedicated reviewers that would commit to turning uh, these cases around very quickly. Uh, but then, you know, I mean, uh, the other part of the publication cycle that gets long is that we'll send it to back to the authors and they'll take a long time in making their revisions and their changes, or they'll not do it um, fully. Sometimes uh, authors will neglect or, or decide not to make certain changes and the reviewers aren't going to let it go forward until they do. And so that, that's why sometimes it goes multiple cycles in the review process. And, you know, if we could get all those things handled, it might be nice to have really current cases. Students just love it. Um, I did a, a short case one time taught. The case was only six uh, months old by the time I taught it. And they just thought that was that they were talking about something that was really current and that, you know, it, it was uh, far more relevant to them than, you know, the cases that uh, we had one once that uh, it was about the brewing industry. And uh, the case started with the ancient Egyptians brewing beer. You know, as soon as the students hit that, they pretty much turned it off. Yeah, material sounds like a good idea. So who's going to submit a case to this special issue if I if I launch one? Anybody? A couple people. I already have one. Sure. Thinking about it. Beer appeals to students. Well, I'm sure we could probably find a COVID-19 beer case, too. Having the due date in early January, is that the suggestion? Janet says she'll do a quick and thorough review.
Elizabeth had a startup case at her table that might fit. All right, lots to think about. Well, I wanna thank you for putting up with my coughing today. I haven't taught in a while, so I haven't spoken this long for a while. I'm out of training, I guess. Um, but uh, hopefully I've given you something to think about. I would love the case journal. And um, if you want to uh, read the editorial letter about the funny smelling milk, uh, the link is in the Emerald booth in the uh, expo section. So thanks for coming. I had fun. <laughs>